Right then, hello everybody. We are going to get started and hello to everybody online as well because I know we've just gone live. Um, hello, just going to share my screen and we are going to get cracking with Azure and some DevOps. So today is going to be a pretty fun session. There's a hands-on episode or a hands-on part of the session later on. Um, we're going to go through some theory straight away. So let me just grab this and put this up onto the stream. Sorry, we're like doing this online as well. I'm just going to get my slides up. Cool. So welcome. I'm glad to see so many of you here. And I'm so happy to see everybody with laptops, or most of you with laptops as well, because we have some hands-on. As with every session that we run here at Reactor, uh, we also have a code of conduct. Please just have a quick read of this one. Uh, so the general gist is to be kind, be aware, be nice to others. We're all here to learn and have some fun. So if you are online and you have questions, throw them in the chat because we do have a moderator who's going to be able to help me with this one. Uh, I will be able to see them as well. But uh, of course, anybody in the room, put your hand up. We will get a microphone to you so that everybody online can also hear your questions as well. So a quick agenda. What are we going to do today? Well, I'm going to tell you who I am, where I came from, and what I do today. We are going to go over a little bit of uh, app development environments that we have in Microsoft Azure, going to look at the DevOps lifecycle, a holistic view of what DevOps is. We're then going to drill down into Azure DevOps, which is a service quite aptly named from Microsoft, uh, which is brilliant. Uh, they managed to take an entire sort of tech sector and name a product after it, which was quite fun. Going to have a little look at GitHub. For those of you uh, who don't know what GitHub is, GitHub is a company which Microsoft acquire. We work part and part with GitHub themselves. Uh, it's a fantastic tool and service. So I'll tell you a little bit about that one. Got a bit of a break and we're going to have some food here. So I'm sorry to everybody online, but we're going to have a break uh, and we're going to have food. So you can have your virtual pizza. We will have ours here today. And then we've got hands-on and I'm going to show you how you can incorporate Azure and GitHub together in a single application where we're going to show you how to create a blog, a travel blog. So I like to travel the world and I thought, quite fun. Let's put two and two together. Let's have a bit of fun. So who am I? So my name is Liam Hampton, and I'm a senior cloud advocate here at Microsoft. I'm an author ambassador, which basically means I think about security. So I go to many conferences all around the world, and I speak to many developers. However, security is never a top focus for them. They always talk about getting straight into the code, getting it straight down and dirty. That's not always the case, and it shouldn't always be the case when you're developing. So you should always be looking at security first, hence why I became an also ambassador. I'm also a Dev Network Advisory Board member. Um, sounds pretty boring, but it's actually pretty fun. Get to look and sort of organize hackathons and uh, conferences all around the world, which is great fun. And I write a lot of Go code. For those of you who don't know what Go is, Go is a language, much like Python or Java or JavaScript. Many of them, I just focus on Go. That's my background. That's what I stick with. And finally, I like to travel the world. I've been to many continents around the world, and I love it. So I like to incorporate what I do in tech into what I do in my personal time. Do we have any questions so far? Perfect, exciting room. So just let you know, this is probably not going to take the whole two and a half hours. I'm just going to get down with this. Um, it's going to be a pretty overview, or pretty good overview of what DevOps is. And then we're going to go into a break and have hands on. So we I'm not going to keep you here till 8, 8.30. So let's get into it. What are app development environments? Well, we have a number of them. So dev and test. Who here has heard of development and testing in Azure? You have, one person. Brilliant. So the reason we use it is to allow you to reduce your risks. OK, so when you are building your applications, you don't want to have lots of bugs in them. You want the flexibility of being able to choose the environment that you work in. So with Azure Dev and Test environments, there's a whole, number, whole bunch of them here on the screen. So we've got uh, Dev Test Labs. We've got GitHub Code Spaces, Azure Virtual Desktop. We have got what's the other one? Azure Chaos Studio, Chaos Engineering, basically. So many things that you can do. Helps you have a controlled environment to which you can throw your application in, write your test plans, write your code, really hammer it and get down with it. OK, so you do that because you don't want any bugs in production. You want to eliminate all of that. And of course, cost saving. As a developer, I have done this many times. I have not tested properly. And I have thrown stuff into production or you know, quite flimsy code. And it hasn't really been the best. 
choice. I have cost organizations lots of money by doing so. I'll hold my hands up. Every developer does that. Um, but yeah, cost saving is a really big benefit of dev and test. We've got web. So you've all heard of the World Wide Web. You all know what a website is. But how do you see those web pages? Well, we've got a whole bunch of services that allow you to deploy your applications, Azure App Service. Really cool serverless uh, service that you can use. And I'm going to be using that later in the hands-on demo for you. We've got Azure Front Door, which is a CDN, Content Delivery Network. Who knows what a content delivery network is? Perfect. So for those of you who don't know what a C C CDN is, imagine you're storing a file in Australia, and you want to access it from the UK, other side of the world. There's obviously going to be a bit of latency when you're trying to access that file. A CDN allows you to store a copy of that in the UK. So you have a virtual copy over this side of the world. So when you go to access it from your house in London, it's much quicker. There's no latency. It's much faster. That's essentially what a content delivery network is at face value. We've got Azure Signal R, which is a real-time data transmission library, allowing you to, or service rather, allows you to have web traffic over HTTP. It's a .NET library. We're not going to go into that one too much, but it's just real-time data transmission. We have got Azure Cognitive Search. So when you press, I don't know, CMD or Command F on a Word document, and you have a little search box, that's what Azure Cognitive Search allows you to do. You can embed this kind of thing into your application, allowing you to search wherever you are. And of course, we've incorporated AI because that's what we do now. We throw AI into everything. Then you've got APIs. So an API is basically a way of you allowing to get data. You call an API with a request. So when you go to a website, you make an API request, that is a get request, to retrieve your data or the website data. We have Azure App Service because you can deploy API services to App Service. Don't worry if you don't understand all of this. We are going to be going into this a little bit deeper with the hands-on episode in a bit. And of course, API management. Say you've got a lot of API servers and a lot of APIs that you want to hit and manage in a corporate, you know, in, in a big infrastructure, you're going to have a lot of APIs that you're going to be playing with. So of course, we have an API manager helps you do that. Container orchestration. Who knows what a container is? Cool, so we've got a couple of hands. A container is essentially a package of code. So when you build a bit of program and you want to package it up, a container gives you essentially a minimum viable operating system for you to run that code on. So it takes everything you have locally, packages it, bundles it up into a nice little ball, and you can share it and distribute it in many different ways. It's a disposable way of you sharing your code. And of course, we've got Kubernetes service. We have got container instances. And of course, you could put app services here as well, because you can deploy containers to app service too. But it's a scalable way of you deploying your infrastructure. You'll see a lot of Kubernetes services all over the place. You probably have used them. You just don't realize what you're using uses Kubernetes. And of course, Kubernetes is open source. Open source is a way of the community maintaining projects and products in the open, hence open source. Now, what you'll see is a lot of cloud providers, let's say Azure or Microsoft or Amazon or Google, take a fork of that, so take a copy of it, and make it their own, allowing their own service APIs to be hit. So Kubernetes, a fantastic, heavyweight, durable service that you can run with. And of course, you have container registry. When you build and package up all of your bits of code, where do you stick them? You're not going to store them in a bucket. You're not going to store them. I know on your machine locally, well, you might do, but you probably shouldn't. You're going to store them in a registry. Who has heard of Docker? Sure, more hands on upon Docker. Docker is a way of you to build or, or managing containers. It's, a, sort of, it's a, a company, but it's a very widely known company when it comes to containers. Now, Docker Hub is a container registry. We've got Azure Container Registry, which is up there. We have got, I think mean, you've got Quay. You've got all the different wonderful registries allowing you to store these containers. Serverless technologies. This is a fun one. We have come from on-premise racks all the way to serverless technologies over the years, over the past 20 years. So we've gone from, I don't know, us storing stuff in a back cupboard in there, you can probably hear it whirling away, which is on-premise servers, server racks. We've then gone to virtual machines, which is essentially your laptop and one of those, but many of them. We've gone from virtual machines to containers, 
and now containers to serverless. There's a bit of contention there, but at face value, that's how we've progressed over the past 20 years. In Azure, we've got Azure Functions. If anybody was on my stream earlier at midday, I was playing with Azure Functions, and it is a way of you just writing the code as a developer. So let's say you don't care about the operating system. You don't care where your code is being stored. You don't, worry, you don't need to worry about any of the infrastructure. You just care about writing your code, and you want to write hello world and to the website, and that's all you want to do. That's fine. You can with functions. And of course, we have Logic Apps. Logic Apps is an automated or an automation tool, which is event-driven, low-code, no-code, in Azure, allowing you to kick off emails when somebody signs up to your product, or allowing you to, I don't know, send them a text message or something. You know, it's event driven. Something has to happen for it to be ignited and kicked off. Just a really cool way to do it in Azure. So how does that all tie into DevOps? Well, all of that kind of is DevOps. DevOps is a holistic approach to software development, of, well, specifically the software development lifecycle, especially within teams. Now, I do have a video to play from Abel Wang, but it's not going to play on here. It's not playing ball with me. So we're going to skip this one, but I will cover it anyway. If you were to Google what DevOps is, you are going to be faced with all of this. Now, these are actually taken, all of these are taken from the top three cloud providers in the market today. It all very much says the same thing in a different way. But that's fine. You don't want that. We care about just a couple of words, OK? It's development. It is operations. That is what DevOps stands for. Development and operations. You've got two sides of the team. You've got the coders and the deployers. It's cultural. So it's very much how do teams work together? How do the development team work with the operations team? How can one developer wear many hats? It's high velocity. You want to develop at speed. You want to iterate quickly. Your clients or, say, somebody's bought a product from you. They want to change on that product. In a waterfall methodology, that might take you six weeks to get out the door. If they say, oh, you, you colored it green and I wanted it blue, well, then you have to go all the way through. Is it accessible? Does it work? Does the text color need to change to make it more visible? Whereas with DevOps, one developer can go in and say, change the color, do the testing, do the operations, send it on its way. Much quicker. So velocity. And it's collaborative. You are going to be talking a lot more within your teams because there's fewer of you. You don't have the development team. You don't have the testing team. You then don't have a QA team, quality assurance team. You have a smaller team doing all of that with better tools. That is what DevOps is. Now, a roundabout approach is Solomon Brown, great guy, said, DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. That is, in a nutshell, what DevOps is. Show of hands, who has seen this before. Sure, we're getting somewhere like that. More people, are, more hands are going up now. This is what I would say is the unofficial DevOps lifecycle logo or mascot. Now there's eight stages, plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, and monitor. That's a lot of steps for, let's say, a couple of developers. So you break it down into smaller teams. You break it down into a developer wearing many hats. What happens in the plan stage? Well, you're planning for future. You don't want to build in technical debt. You really don't want to have security vulnerabilities. So you're going to be looking at the packages you're going to install, the versions of the code that you're going to be installing in your teams. You're going to be looking at how scalable is your system. Are you choosing products or services which are not very scalable in the architecture that you currently have? You're going to be writing this all down on paper. And this is in the planning stage. You then have the coding stage. What are your core requirements? What language are you going to be writing in? How maintainable is your code? How are you going to version it? You know, you've got subversion or Git, two version control technologies, really popular, more so Git than SVN, but still very much the same in your teams. What are you going to be using? You got build. You're going to be packaging up the code. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be releasing it? How are you going to automate it? OK, but this is usually the automated part. This is where the DevOps starts coming in, automation. Because in the build stage is where you're going to be building your assets. You know, I said a container, you have your code, you package it up. You don't want to do that manually. You want to do it automatically. So that's, this is where we start to bring automation in. And then my favorite is test. So I'm a test 
Test-Driven Development, or TDD, is what that stands for, Test-Driven Development, where it goes red, amber, green. What that really means is you write the test first, you watch it fail. You then write all the code you can to get that test to pass. Once it's passing, you then go back and refactor. Why do you do that? Well, it helps with your efficiency. It helps you to write only just enough code you need in your product or service. It's maintainable by the team. So this is where you start thinking about test room developments. You start thinking about the readability, the unit test, your integration test, all the things that you want to go in to make sure that your architecture is holding together, especially with the code that you're writing. Then we have the release cycle, or the release side of it. Now, this is, as you've seen at the top, this is now the operation side, ops. What happens here? Are we going to be looking at rolling updates? Are we going to be looking at blue-green deployments or canary deployments, where you'll sort of have two environments in the wild at once, and you slowly rein it in? Who on here has been on Instagram, and you have seen a feature that your friend doesn't have yet? Very much what they're doing there. They're slowly phasing it out. They're going to be gathering um, different metrics from different users. Is that working well? Is it not? If it's working well, then maybe they can deploy that feature to more people. And you can slowly, that's the different release cycles that you have. But different products and different services have different ways of doing it or different needs. And my favorite, shadow. Shadow deployment is where you literally have two of them in the wild at once. And one of them is being consistently hit. And well, they're both being consistently hit, but one endpoint goes back to the old one, goes back to the users, and the new one that you have just goes straight back to you. So they don't see that. It's all about shadowing the response. And then you have the deploy stage. Where's it going to? Are you pushing it to container instances? Are you pushing it to Kubernetes? Is it going to be on a virtual machine? Are you going to run your system in a hybrid environment? Are you going to have some of it on premise? Are you going to have some of it in the cloud? This is where you're going to be starting to look at how your code is being deployed. And of course, you have Operate. Was it successful? Is it able to take live loads? Is it able to be hammered? Can you really test your product in the wild? And of course, this is where you have feedback. What are your users saying? Are your users saying it's wonderful? Or are they saying it's, well, it's pretty poor? I know we're going, a lot of this is happening in Twitter right now, that's for sure. We're seeing a lot of this where users are giving feedback consistently. And of course, <coughs> chaos engineering is the fun one because it allows you to just throw your product out in the wild and have somebody hit it a million times over, really thrash it, and see how long it takes to fall over. Chaos engineering is fun, dangerous, and definitely not something you should be doing. And then of course, you have monitoring. This is the final step. This is where you're going to be looking at all your performance. Is your code really performing how, how you expect it to? Are there any bottlenecks? This is where you're going to take all that customer feedback and iterate over the loop. This is where you're going to start going around that infinity lifecycle. You take all of that on board, and then you iterate, and you get better and better and better. Now, a large team is not going to be doing this. You don't have small teams doing it. And that's perfectly fine. This is the whole point of DevOps. So what are some common mistakes? And I apologize, this slide is not the prettiest. Um, oversimplification. People think it's really simple to implement DevOps. I've worked in teams which have tried and miserably play it failed. I have worked in teams which have done really well and teams that have asked lots of diff difficult questions. As an engineer, it's hard to get right. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's just what works best for you and your engineers. Underutilization of automation. Bit of a tongue twister, but certainly a problem. People tend to take DevOps and don't trust automation. They don't trust some of the tools to their full potential. They don't use it as they should. So they'll start taking out manual steps and then that's when you get user errors. I've certainly seen that happen before. Not using the multi-hat approach. By that, I mean a developer is developing, a tester is testing, and a quality assurance person is going to be checking if it's all OK. A developer should be doing all of that and have a second opinion afterwards. That's how it should be rolling, right? A developer should be writing the tests. A developer should be deploying the code. A developer should know that inside out, and so should the whole team. Scope creep. Now, I'm not sure how many people of you in the room are professional developers. Pretty sure of hands if you are. Perfect. Scope creep is when you are working on an item, you're writing some code, and suddenly you think, oh, this will be really handy for me later down the line. This is going to be really handy for me next week. So you start working on that item as well, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So essentially, you end up with a really small ticket 
being really long and taking you forever. So it's all about breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. And security, I've got a question on there, question mark, and that is because people don't think about security. You'll often hear the word DevSecOps. Now to me, well, breaking that down is developer secure or development, security, and operations, but it's just DevOps done properly. You should always be thinking about security, but people don't. And then finally, people forget it's a loop. They do it once really well, or they do it poorly really, well, they do it poorly, and then they just don't bother with it again. They're like, oh, it's fine. We've got our release out there. We can just ad hoc send releases manually. It's fine. But no. So who now benefits from all of this that's happened? Thank you. Everyone. You have got developers, Q&A, sales, operation, test engineers, customers, project management. Everybody benefits because it is velocity, speed, communication, and all the tools that help you do that. So if we look back at this, you can see we've covered all of the eight steps. But what technology do we really use in it? Well, planning. You'd use GitHub. We have Jira boards. You may have seen some other tools do that. But I use GitHub. Coding. I'm a Go engineer, so I use Go. And I version control with Git. Building. Maven and Gradle. We've got a whole bunch of cool build tools, depending on your language, that's what you'll be using. Testing, Cypress, Chai, Mocha, all of the front testing libraries that you can use to test your code. Now, developers sometimes don't like testing because it involves writing double the code, but in actual fact, you're writing half the code because you're not writing as much as you would if you weren't testing to catch all your edge cases. Releasing, Jenkins. You may have seen that before, that lovely gentleman with a cup of tea. Butler, rather. Deployment. Deploy with Docker to Azure. So these, all of these tools that I've kind of mentioned so far, you can see them starting to creep in at different parts of the lifecycle here. Operation. We've got Kubernetes and Ansible. And as you can see as we go around, they're getting a little bit more popping up. Monitoring. We have Splunk. We have got... Azure Monitor, we've got analytics, we've got a whole bunch of suite of tools that you can use at every different stage. Now, if you've ever been or ever go to a conference, you're going to start to see a lot of companies picking a certain part of this lifecycle and building a tool around it. You could have somebody or a company specifically for monitoring, like we have with Splunk, and they just go head over heels on observability, on code, and how you're writing your code. So what does everything mean? This is what it means. You're delivering value to your customers. You're increasing efficiency of your workloads. You're eliminating all the waste. And what I mean by waste is all the time that you would usually be spending arguing, bickering between teams, you would be spending on code that doesn't need to be written. All of that is waste. You're being as efficient as you possibly can. You're streamlining the feedback loop. You're making sure that your customers, or your, sorry, your stakeholders rather, are able to understand what you're doing, give you the feedback, and then you're able to action on it. We're continuously improving. The first bit of code you write is never gonna be the prettiest, it's never gonna be the best, and it's never gonna be the most efficient. But it's gonna work. And this is where you start to use the DevOps lifecycle to improve. You're continuously improving that. You're able to deliver faster, like I mentioned, when you wanna make a change to your stakeholders, to your customers, clients, you can deliver that much faster with this approach than you could if you're using another approach. And finally, you have the happier customers right at the end. All of that leads to a big smile. How much of a big smile? Well, these statistics kind of say quite a lot. 208 times more frequent deployments. 106 times faster from commit to deploy. So when you make that first commit of your big project, to deploying it into the actual project itself. You have more money. That keeps the business happy and the stakeholders. 2,604 times more faster incident recovery. What happens when things go wrong? Well, if you have test plans in place, if you've got the correct logging, if you're monitoring it correctly, you're going to be able to see where things happen and go wrong, you're able to go and see how to fix it. You're gonna have logs, you're gonna have tails. You're gonna understand what's happening at any point in your system. 
So it's much faster for instant recovery. And of course, seven times lower change failure rate. So when you're changing things, things don't break so often. And that's because you have tests in place. That's because you have developers who know your code base inside out. You're able to onboard new developers. You're able to onboard new team members. Doesn't necessarily be have, to, have to be a developer, but things don't break as fast. And of course, you've got the best one, faster time to market. And that's the ultimate goal here, right? We're trying to keep the stakeholders happy, make the most money, and be the most efficient as we can as developers. That's the purpose of DevOps. So I've been speaking for 25 minutes, and I'm going to show you what Azure DevOps is now. Because, hey, like I said, Microsoft decided to make a product all around an entire tech sector. Well, what is Azure DevOps? Azure DevOps is a platform that provides a suite of tools for managing the software development lifecycle. Basically, everything we've just been through in one product. product. And this is all of them. This is cool. So we have got Azure Boards, Azure Pipelines, Azure Repos, Azure Test Plans, Azure Artifacts, and of course, you can have all the extra extensions for all the other lovely tools that you would be using, whether it's Jenkins, whether it is GitHub, whether it is, I don't know, Ansible, Terraform, Kubernetes. You've got all of the lovely plugins that we can go through. So I forgot to change the link, but we do have another link for that one. And I will pop that link in the chat or we'll get my help or two. And I'll share it with everybody in the room afterwards as well. So what's Azure Boards? Azure Boards are essentially a way of helping you to keep track of your project. You can track, discuss all of your work items. You can have descriptions. You can tie them to pull requests, which is a code change that a developer will make into the main branch, into a repository of code. You can add it to GitHub. So if you're working in two places at once, because it's you know, extensible. And of course, like I said, you can add extensions to this. So if you're using Jira, if you're using a different project board, you can add that in. Azure repos. So what are repos? Well, it's a repository. A repository is a safe house of your code. So if you've got all of your code files, this is where it'll go. You can connect this to VS Code, Xcode, IntelliJ, all of your wonderful environments, depending on whatever code you're writing. Azure Pipelines. This is the automated part. This is where you have, <laughs> this is where you would have uh, different operating systems able to test your code. So if you are writing code on a Mac, like I would be, and I want to test my code on a Windows machine, well, I'd have to go over to my helper and say, hey, can I borrow your Windows machine and just to test my code? That's not going to work. Pipelines help you run that in the cloud, away from your machine. You can be coding on a Raspberry Pi for all I care, and you can still write this code and run it and test it properly for production in the pipelines. And of course, it allows you to deploy. So this is the automated part. You're now building, testing, and running in the cloud and deploying to a cloud of your choice. It doesn't even need to be Azure. You can deploy it to a different cloud if you like. If you have a hybrid system, you can have a multi-cloud approach. You can have a hybrid system. Uh, you can have all in Azure for a weekend. But it allows you to connect to different clouds. And of course, you may have seen this CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. That is a big part of the DevOps lifecycle. Then we have test plans. Well, how do you want to test your code? How do you want to lay out all the different increments that it needs to pass to be able to work efficiently? in the wild. Well, you set out a test plan. And I will go through this. I'm actually going to show you each of these parts in Azure in a moment. You can test across different web apps or desktops, so you can see how it performs in different environments. And of course, it gives you the end-to-end -end traceability. So you may have a little bug hidden when a user clicks a cross button on your application. But you may not necessarily have caught that when you're developing. So having a test plan, enabling somebody to go off and try that and test it and make sure it passes is really, really important. And you can see at what point and how with end-to-end -end traceability. And of course, artifacts. Artifacts is a really fancy way of saying, here's your built binary. So you've packaged up your code into a little container. That container then builds a binary, which you run. So if you are going to, better way to explain this, if you've ever clicked on a .exe file on your desktop, on your machine, that is a binary. That is an executable. That's an artifact. That's essentially just a way of saying, here's your lovely little asset. I'm going to plonk it in a little repository over there, and you can access it anytime you like. 
That's your deployable release. That is what an artifact is. Helps you with Maven, with NPM, all the lovely packages that you want to deploy and hold in a little box. That's an artifact. And of course, it wouldn't be nothing without an Azure project. Now, an Azure project is what it says on the tin. It is a holistic big container that all of that sits within. Okay, so this is how you start to run your application. This is where you have your test plans, where you have your board, where you have your pipeline. Everything is in a project. So let's jump out and have a little look at what a project looks like or what this actually looks like. So over here, hopefully we can all see this one. We have a blog. So this is my blog website. This is something which I just work with. It's a carbon copy of what we're going to be doing today, just in Azure DevOps. And if we click into this one, we are in overview. Now on here, you can see the project statistics. We have got uh, different board items. We have got uh, work tests. We've got repositories. We have got uh, different items and everything that's going on within the code base. If I look on boards, we can see on here that I've got a Kanban board by default, and I've got some unit tests that I need to do. I'm currently building the Git-based workflow, and you can see that there is a change which I was able to play with. But you can move them around. This is essentially what a board is. So Kanban is a way of you dictating and organizing your team's work items within one big view. And of course, you can look at backlogs. You can look at sprints. So uh, I can see what's happening with who at any point. Now, a sprint is a time-based sort of chunk, which says, for the next two weeks, we're going to do all of these work items, and they should be completed by the end of the sprint. Just a really visual way of seeing it. Repositories, repos. This is where all the code lives. So this, whoever you may or may not have seen GitHub, pretty much a carbon copy of what we have on GitHub, a good way of you seeing all of your different files. So this is all code files that I've written that make up the blog. And as you can see, we've got a readme. And we're going to be going through this later. I have a much prettier version, which I'm going to share with you. Um, you'll be able to see this happen in real time. But you can see all the different commits that you make with all of the code. So when you're making a commit and you're making a change, this is where you can see it. You can see a track of that. So you can see when I created it today, I added a readme. I removed the readme. I added uh, some code. And then I tried to set up a CI CD pipeline. So this is your traceability, and this can track, and you can see everything from right within this view. Again, you can see pushes and different branches. So as you can see, that failed over there. So it's pretty visual. Uh, you have branches and what you're going to be working on. So if I want to create a feature on this blog, if I want to change a picture, I would go off and create a branch. And then I would make that change, and then I would make a pull request. And that pull request would be the change that I've made into the main branch. So it's a way of you diverging off the norm, going back into it. You can create tags and, again, pull requests. I haven't created either of those two. Um, and then we have pipelines. Now, as you can see, I have a pipeline which is failing, and that's deliberate. But a pipeline is the automated step. So if I click into it, you can see that I run it a couple of times, and you can sort of drill down as to why and what's happened. And you can see here that I have not got any parallel hosts. Basically, I haven't granted any permission. I'm not allowed to run it. And that's fine, because I'm going to show you how you can do that with GitHub as well. You can see the different environments. I don't believe I set this up for this project. Um, different releases. So if I want to release version one uh, after, after a month, and then I want to release version two after two months, and so forth. This is where you can have your releases. This is where people can go and download your project or your binary or your artifact and start installing and running. <coughs> and test plans. So I have, I think, one test, test the website. Check for present files. So this is a test plan where I'm saying, go and make sure all of the files are there in this repository. Now I'm going to, again, I'm going to show you how I'm doing this visually with GitHub. Um, but this is a test case of a test plan. Now I would usually, in a bigger team, have multiple test cases in multiple test plans, enabling me to make sure that my product is as good and as best as it can possibly be. You can see the run. So basically, you're configuring your environment for that test plan to run. So you can change it. You can make sure that, I don't know, the cross button to close the window might be in the top right corner on a Windows machine. But on a Mac, it's going to be on the top left. So you'd have a test case to test for those, making sure it's actually doing what you think or want it to do. And of course, artifacts, 
again, it would build afterwards, but this is where your artifacts would be stored. So your artifacts, like I said, is a binary or something that you install. It's your application. It's what you want to make. And that's where you store them. So well, let's jump back into these slides. And now I'm going to talk about some value stream maps. Who's heard of a value stream map? Wonderful. We have one. A value stream map is a way to help you analyze your current release cycle. OK, so this is essentially how we're going to now turn DevOps into a number. OK, and that sounds pretty odd, I know, but it'll make sense in a second. It visually shows you everything you need to know about your process, what happens at every stage, and how you can work through that with your team. Really good indication is this one. OK, so. KPI, Key Performance Indicator, okay? You've probably heard of KPIs or OKRs or something like that. We have got a function that we're going to create, okay? And we can see here, source control, and it's taken three days. We have got some coding that's going to happen. That's going to take four days. We have got a spreadsheet. So once that's been coded and tested and done whatever they need to do with it, it's going to take two days. And then they're going to test it some more, and that's going to take three days. Okay, then you need to fix some bugs because the testing people found some bugs. Okay, you can kind of see how this is quite long and drawn out at this point. And then you need to put it into your pre-prod, which is pre-production environment. A pre-production environment is a way of you saying, it emulates your production. So before you throw it into the wild, before you get it right in front of your customers, you're going to have a pre-prod or pre-production environment, which allows you to test this in the wild. So it's passed everything internally. Can it cope with the external environment, but it's still sheltered, still gatekeeping. And then finally, if it passes all of that, you then pass it to the customer. But we've got a number of days here. The lead time is 22 days, OK? This customer wanted that change done. And we said it's going to take 22 days for you to do that. The processing is going to take five days. So what I mean by processing is how long did it really take for you to actually make that change? Four days coding. Maybe like one day of developing or deploying, sorry. So that's five days. So now you can turn this into a KPI. You do five divided by 22, which is the activity ratio, which is going to be process time divided by your total lead time equals 0.23, 23%. That's pretty poor. You want to be getting that as close to 100% as possible. 100% is the most efficient it could ever be. Probably never going to get there. But that is your activity ratio. That's how you turn DevOps into a number. Because now we're saying, if we implement a DevOps lifecycle, how long is it going to take us to code that? How long is it going to take us to test it? How long is it going to take us to deploy and release it? So now you can see how all of that wonderful chat has turned into a number, an efficient number, a KPI. And that's how teams actually understand the efficiency of their teams. So when we look at businesses who are, I don't know, number driven, this is what they look at. And it's a really important thing to understand. So now the, one of the best bits, GitHub. Hands up if you know GitHub. Yes, wonderful. Lots of hands. OK. So they're an industry leader. OK, absolutely, hands down, industry leading in repository hosting. So holding your code, making sure that it's safe, making sure that it is in the place it should be, and integrating with all the lovely applications that you want to be developing. So there's a number of key features. You've got expert sharing. So we have got GitHub and GitHub Enterprise, two different sort of offerings. One is very much public. One is an enterprise. So if you own a company and you want to have all of your code housed underneath your own little roof or your own separate roof away from the public domain, GitHub Enterprise is the way to go. Cross-team collaboration. So I showed you Azure DevOps. Pretty much a carbon copy on GitHub with issues, issue tracking, project boards. Code reuse. What do I mean by that? Well, I made something. You can also take my code and modify it. I mentioned that Kubernetes is an open source project. If you take Kubernetes, you're reusing that code to build upon it in your own domain. So you have services that you want to use with Kubernetes. You can fork that repository and use it. So you're using a lot of code. You're not rewriting it from scratch every time. 
code spaces, really fun bit. Now we're going to be using that today in the hands-on, and it is essentially VS Code in a web browser. You probably may or may not have seen this, people accessing it from Apple Watches. It's going to an internet browser and using somebody else's computer to develop your applications. Really cool if you don't have the environment locally. Maybe you are in the middle of a desert and you want to access it. OK, so you've got a 5G hotspot, but you only have your mobile phone. You can still write some pretty complex applications from your mobile phone. Really cool way of getting into coding. You don't need the best equipment. You don't need a big gaming PC to spin up a great big application or a Hello World application that you want to be writing. Codespaces allows you to do that. GitHub Actions. We looked at pipelines with Azure DevOps. GitHub Actions is the same thing, kind of. It allows you to build and deploy your applications all within GitHub. But the best bit is, the actions are open source. So say we're going to be using one later where we are logging into Azure and the container registry. But we're using an action which I can then go and find in GitHub itself. So it pulls in other repositories. This whole holistic view of open source starts to come together with lots of different services. And of course, we've got Copilot. Copilot is, well, a really fun AI tool to help you code. It is your best friend as an engineer if you're learning to code. You've heard of ChatGPT, right? Pretty similar to that. It uses a very similar um, AI engine behind it called Codex or OpenAI Codex. Basically, been trained specifically on code. So rather than ChatGPT being a holistic model, LLM, so a large language model, Codex is like specifically been trained for Copilot on code to help you get the best answers you can. Which is why if you sort of start asking it lots of code questions, Copilot might give you a very similar answer to what you get in ChatGPT, just how it works. So a sample repository, which we kind of touched on already, but we're going to drill into it a bit more with GitHub. You have a readme. Now your readme is how you document your project, how you're going to show other people what it is, explaining your project to the open world. You have a security.md, defining your security policy, making sure that you have the right licenses in place, the right versions. And then you have the license itself. So open source, well, when you write open source code, you are licensing that code. You've got Apache, you've got MIT, you have got GPL. You've got lots of different licenses, which mean lots of different things. That's a whole kettle of fish itself and a legal matter. But again, you have to be really careful what you choose so that you're not held responsible. If your code, somebody else uses your code and it breaks their production system and costs them lots of money, you want to make sure that you're covered. And that's how you do it with your different licenses. Code owners. Say you're in a team of five people and you're writing lots of code every day. Code owners gives you the option to define who looks after what piece of code is in that repository. So say somebody in the open world, I want to commit to somebody else's project, which I can in open source. If I commit to a specific bit of code and there's a code owner that owns it, they'll be the person to review it with a pull request. Then you have pull requests, which allows you to merge your changes. If you're writing code, you're going to create a pull request. So your feature, putting it into the main branch of the code base. And then, of course, you have releases. And this allows you to bundle your project together for download. We've all heard of zip files, right? It allows you to zip up all of your code or all of your assets into one zip file or a tar GZ, and other people can download it in a release or a binary. Very much everything you use, or you would have used it before, you've downloaded something on the internet, it's come from a repository like this. So, code spaces. What is code spaces? I said you can use it on your Apple Watch. It is basically a virtual desktop for VS Code, except you don't have access to the underlying system. It is just VS Code in a browser. But again, it allows you to do so much. You can have dev containers, which is a package of code that give you certain things. So say I want to write an application which talks to Azure, but I need the Azure CLI. I can specify in my dev container that I need the Azure CLI when I spin it up so that I don't have to go rooting around and downloading it whilst I'm in there. Marketplace extensions, I can do exactly that. You can specify what it is that you want to download from a marketplace. 
And then when you set it up, all you have to do is press a button and say open. And then it's open for you. You don't need to download anything. You don't need to do any extra steps. It's just there. And then when you close it, well, it shuts all down again. So Codespace is a really, really great way to start your development. And of course, Copilot. Now, let's have a little look at this one. This is the fun bit. So hopefully, if we open up that link, it is your AI programmer. So you can give it natural language prompts, just like you would with ChatGPT, and it will spit out code for you. So as you can see here, it said, you know, determine whether the sentiment of the text is positive. Use a web service. Well, it's gone off and done exactly that. You can look it in different languages. We have Python. If you write Python code, this isn't necessarily cheating. It's just a way to help you understand what you're writing in a more comprehensive manner. Lots of different things that you can do with it. So let's have a little look. Do you want it to write an entire function? It can do exactly that, which I think is pretty cool. If you want to see what else it can work with, it can work with all your IDEs. So Vero Studio, VS Code, JetBrains IDE, and probably more on the way. And of course, there's going to be facts and figures about developers being 80% more productive. You know, it's true. They really are. I mean, I certainly start using it in a lot of my streams now. I use it whenever I code all the time. It's a really cool way to help me understand what's going on. Say, I don't want to keep scrolling through lots of different documentation to find out how to call a certain API in a service. I'll just ask Copilot to help me find it. What's the API I need to call? And it will spit out some code. It might not be the correct code straight away, but it'll be darn near close enough that I can play with it and work with it. So Copilot is a really, really cool way to get started as a developer. Now let's go back into slides. And we go. And again, Copilot X is another cool video. But again, it's not going to play because of people online. The stream, it's, the sound's not going to come out. Um, but I'll explain it anyway. Copilot X is basically ChatGPT in VS Code. It's Copilot on steroids, basically. A really good, better, beefier version of Copilot. It's the newest, the greatest. And you can ask it prompts like a ChatGPT, like you can with Bing, if you've used Bing, the new plugins, right? Very much similar to that. Now, do we have any questions? Because we're going to head for a little short break. No, all quiet. Yeah, OK. We have oh, a microphone. Sorry, one second. Yep, that's working. Yeah. Nice one. Thank you. OK. Hi, you mentioned uh, in the DevOps uh, section uh, yep. that uh, the teams are very small. Does that mean that uh, in a large enterprise, you have many teams, and therefore to actually uh, manage many teams developing uh, you know, various codes, how do you then kind of manage that? Good By question. the way, I'm a project manager, so. Exactly. So you kind of alluded to what I was about to say anyway. So with many development teams under an umbrella, it creates this hierarchy of levels, right? So you have project managers. You'll have different product managers. You'll have managers who look after teams. You'll end up with this sprawling sort of diagram of different teams in different areas of the business. So when I say smaller teams, I'm talking eight to 10 people max. That's what I've seen. That's what I've worked in. I've worked on projects which has got different teams in different locations around the world working on a similar project or different parts of a project. So it's all about being really dynamic and understanding different areas. So very much creates a hierarchy of different teams at different levels. It allows people to move around easier. It allows people to understand what's going on a little bit better uh, rather than having one strict straight down sort of system of people, it just breaks it up, bite-sized chunks. It certainly makes it more interesting, that's for sure, yes. for everyone of the team managers. Yes. But I think uh, having uh, that uh, very wide uh, sort of structure is, is, could be a challenge in a, in a large corporation. Very much so. There are certainly challenges. Of course there are. There's always going to be challenges when you have lots of teams in lots of areas. 
Um, I've personally been in teams in the UK, and I've worked with teams in Australia and in the US Pacific Coast. It's been very difficult because then you're sort of relying on people to be awake when you're asleep. And of course, when you're awake, they're asleep. So of course, it introduces a lot of challenges, but when it comes to deliverables, you're now working in teams which are working around the clock. So that is, it speeds up. So there's always pros and cons. EA framework, okay. No, I, I'm an EA by trade. Go for it. So, and I, I deal with this type of thing globally. Okay. Um, so if you like use something like TOGAF, or the other one you might come across is MODAF, which is a Ministry of Defense one. If you look at those frameworks, that's how you then use, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. That's how you then use something like DevOps to deploy and yeah. bring your teams together. Wonderful, thank you. No, it's always good to have answers. We have more. Wonderful. Um, no, Copilot and Copilot X, you know, as a developer AI tool, sounds really exciting. Um, I have a question regarding the security of its use. So do you, is this like public? Because, you know, you read in the media, some of the financial institutions have used it, you know, people have seen what they've written and therefore that poses a security risk. Is Copilot and Copilot X poses the same exposure? Does it give that same exposure? I'd be very careful how I answer that one. Um, yes, there are laws in place. Um, and of course, you've probably seen in the media that there are obviously corporations or governments looking into exactly how these large language models are being used and trained. Um, certainly through Copilot, being using the Codex uh, framework, very much specifically trained on code, which is open. So again, you have to be really careful how you use it. And you've always, we always go by, you know, don't ever put your personal data, any sensitive data, all those kind of things into it. So it's very much a one-to-one. -one. How sensible are you at using the tools as to how sensible they're going to be retaliating and retaining your data? So of course, you need to be very careful. It's all very new. And why I say new, it's not new. It's very much in focus at the moment. These have been around for a long time. Let's not forget, we've been using AI, Google Maps for, for years, right? But in terms of the data that it takes in and spits out and retains, very much come to the limelight very recently. So yeah, totally appreciate the question and I love it because it's always nice to be aware of how everything is being used. So maybe we can say maybe uh, uh, with GitHub, we can replace the co-pilot with the GitHub rather than GitLab because GitLab is more organization side, right, Bitbucket, because we can't use the co-pilot in the company side because there are security concerns, just like I'm working in the MasterCard. Yep. And there is a lots of compliance issues. Yes. Okay. Of course. So maybe we can say, uh, uh, maybe personal use, we can use a copilot. Suppose you want to, uh, I suppose I have the uh, JavaScript knowledge, right? Yep. And I want to do something in the Python. So there is no need to learn the Python, just go to the chat GPT and copilot, and you can write down your code in the JavaScript, you can convert it into the Python, and then you can deliver it. Yep, 100%. So that's part of GitHub Labs. Very much, very similar, right? So kind of may or may not have seen it on the screen, but there's obviously Copilot for business as well. So that all kind of integrates. These offerings are going to be, or I presume they are sort of very separate at the moment, deliberately, um, but I can only guess they're going to be more amalgamated in the future. So Autopilot is a, a Copilot is a free writer for just like ChatGPT? Yep, so you can get a 60-day free trial of Copilot, um, but then it's 10 pounds or $10 per month. Oh, okay. But it's certainly very much for the everyday developer. I mean, I pay that, I have that. Cool. It is definitely worth it. It speeds up what I do and helps me greatly. Um, there's, a, there's always going to be a cost associated with using these projects, very much like code spaces, which we're going to use later. And uh, you've kind of already touched on it, but there's always a cost associated, but there's always a free limit. And again, you have the 60-day free trial um, if you weren't part of the tech preview. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I have a question about some of the phases with the DevOps pipeline. I really like the presentation. And it seems to me that there's lots of overlap between the operate and monitor phases yep. in terms of trying to evaluate how the code is working. Is that correct? And there is a bit of a blur between the two? Yep, there's always gonna be a blur between these technologies deliberately uh, in a way that enables you as a developer to wear these many hats. So rather than being completely separate as a test engineer, you can also write tests as a developer, but you're still writing code. So you're still able to test that code. So there's always gonna be an overlap of writing tests and developing code. The same as if you're deploying code, you're gonna be writing uh, maybe YAML files or JSON, which is just a, you know, a format of how you articulate code, but it's still very much coding. 
So a developer can then use transferable skills throughout the process to deliver the service, the product, right? So yeah, there's always an overlap. There always will be. And of course, you're going to have people which are stronger at development than writing tests or deploying code and understanding the operation side versus the development side. There's always two different ways to it. I'm going to go a few more, and then we're probably going to head for a break in about three minutes. Hi, um, my name is Gloria, and I've just started my first ever DevOps project. And I saw on the previous slide that you put some common mistakes, and you said yourself that you've you've had some common mistakes yourself. Yep. I just wanted to know how you faced those challenges, how you overcame them. Oh, I love it. Being honest. Um, being honest about the mistakes is really important in a small team. You need to take ownership and responsibility of what you're developing. If you mess up, you mess up. It's a lesson learned. You're not failing. You're not, you know, you may harm the business in a monetary or financial way, but you minimize it. And that's when you start working in these teams to help minimize your, your recovery period, right? So if I made that mistake and it was not recoverable within a couple of hours, then we got a big problem because it's going to start costing more and more and more and more. But being in the team, which enabled me to understand what's going on and other people knowing what I was doing and how it was kind of happened, minimizes that cost and minimizes those mistakes. So it's having that more of a holistic view as a developer. So everybody's on a level playing field at that point. And it's all about trying to keep balance with your team. So me personally, I was just honest, threw my hand up and said, I messed up. You know, it happened. It always does happen to developers. Um, it always will do. Um, it's just one of those things that you live and learn. But we do one more, and then we're going to head for a break. Cool. And we have some online questions. Um, so mine links in really well with that, actually. So if you're going to DevOps entry level, there's obviously an assumption that you need to create efficient code. You need to develop, you know, streamline code. How um, is there an industry standard way to deal with people who are going into DevOps in, like entry level? Like how, how do they kind of learn across the process? Because there'll be a lot of things they don't know. Certainly. So if you're learning to sort of go into a DevOps role sort of from the beginning, there's a number of ways you can do it. So we, there's obviously certifications online, which you can complete. So I believe in Azure, we have AZ400, I believe. Um, you obviously got AWS have their own proprietary courses, same as GCP or Google. Um, so there's always that route to go. Then you've got the understanding the DevOps process itself. So understanding these tools. So DevOps, like I said, is not a technology. It is a mixture of people, processes, and tooling. So understanding people is a really big part of it. You're going to be talking across teams. Understanding how the processes fit together is one part of it. And the other part is obviously the tooling. So understanding the tools. So for me, when I started getting interested in DevOps, it was purely through understanding the tools and working hands-on with pipelines, making those mistakes, pushing stuff to production, making tests, writing tests comprehensively, and understanding more than just writing application code. Like I said, anybody can learn how to write Hello World, but not everybody can understand how to test Hello World, how to build a binary out of that and deploy it to a website, and then how you automate all of that and remove the manual processes. So it's understanding how the different sort of sections, if you want to call them, connect together and with whom you'd be connecting together with. That would probably be my best advice. But go to Microsoft Learn. Microsoft Learn, we've got a lot of um, interesting scenarios on that, which we can walk you through. And we have a few online, and then we will head for a break. Um, so the first question is, can you please explain the difference between Kubernetes and containers with some example of users? Yes, of course. Uh, so Kubernetes is very much a heavyweight champion in container orchestration for a lot of production code. Um, and I'm going to speak to the camera, because that's probably where they're seeing me. Um, an insert or a sort of example of that is if you are working on a heavy application which relies on millions of users, you're probably going to be deploying to Kubernetes. If you're going to be doing rolling updates and you don't want any downtime, you're going to be using Kubernetes. If things go wrong, Kubernetes is a service which is self healing and is managed. However, Kubernetes itself is a whole kettle of fish which you can jump into and dive down. Now, I'll be happy to share a link with something or a, a stream, which I actually did explaining Kubernetes and exactly how to use it in production environments. But it is very much a heavyweight champion. We don't need Kubernetes for what we're going to be developing today. Is it fair to say that 
Kubernetes is a container orchestration or container management tool. Yes, it is. It's exactly that. Um, and you can use containers. That's why Docker and Kubernetes come together quite nicely. Um, yeah, hopefully that kind of answers that question. It's very much down to the problem that you have and the solution of which you're going to be using it. We're not going to use Kubernetes today in our workshop because we don't need Kubernetes. We don't need it to scale up to a thousand instances at the click of our fingers. And it's very costly as well. Second question. I've been using Copilot for a few days. What would be the major difference between Copilot versus Copilot X? Okay. Um, best place to send you is to the website. If you were to Google uh, or Bing, rather. Um, <laughs> Uh, Copilot X, there's videos online as well. It was uh, all in the media recently. Um, so that's probably my best place to send you. Last question, GitHub. Oh, no, actually, that's not a question. It's more of a statement. GitHub will be the mainstream as DevOps tool instead of ADO for DevOps industry. Yes, I somewhat agree. Um, okay. It really depends how you're using it. So AD, uh, Azure DevOps, ADO, as you'll often hear it referenced. Um, is very much down to how you want to solve your problem. GitHub, ADO, very much on level playing field. Just depends what you're using. If you want seamless integration uh, with Azure services, say you're a company using Azure and Azure only, um, you, know, you may want to use Azure DevOps because you have everything under one house, under one umbrella within your browser. There's no context switching. There's no separate services. There's no different APIs. Uh, although they very much look and feel the same, there is slight differences. Um, obviously, if you're open source, you probably want to use GitHub. You don't want to keep you know, proprietary code inside someone's account in Azure. It's very much keep it open source on GitHub. So yes and no is what I'd say to that. One more. So I've heard something called as GitOps as well. Yep. So where is GitOps used? Uh, what, what, How is GitOps different from anything else? Yeah. OK, GitOps is a derivative of DevOps. Is understanding different version controls, uh, how you're going to be working within your team at different release cycles. So again, I, I can actually show you something in, in the break, and I'll probably pull something up to explain that a little bit better afterwards. But GitOps is a derivative, very much like MLOps. You have AIOps. You've got IoT ops. Everybody likes to stick something in front of operations. It's just a way of amalgamating two different um, processes together. Um, a really good tool is Argo CD. Uh, it's a really good uh, tool, uh, which is derived or straight from or aims at GitOps. Um, so, GitOps is, so to understand, GitOps is a generic term, and Argo CD is a tool that does the GitOps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very much so. They, I believe it's open source. So I checked that out as well. Okay. So you've listened to me ramble on for quite a while. Um, we should have some food arriving. Uh, so everybody in here, feel free. We'll take a break back in half an hour. Alrighty, so if you are online, if you're doing this online, welcome back. I'm going to pop in the chat now the link to this repository, which I'm going to, which is it shared? It is shared. Yeah, it, is shared. it is shared. Um, alternatively, you can go to my handle and find this repository. I think it's like the third or fourth down in my list, but it'll probably be at the top by the time we're finished. So yeah, we'll pop that in. The link is aka.ms uh, forward slash build test deploy to Azure. And you'll go to this one. Alrighty, so what is this repository? Well, this repository is a way to build an application, test the application, and deploy it to Azure. So we're gonna be using GitHub and GitHub Actions, and very much a lot of automation. So I've spoken a lot about automation in the previous section and how it helps to encompass the DevOps lifecycle. Now we're actually going to integrate. Now, admittedly, it's a one-man band, it's me, but alternatively, in the real world, this will probably be a team working on this website. And it would allow you to collaborate, work together, put pull requests in, make different branches and features, and so forth. But we're going to go at it with a one-man band, and hopefully you can help me along the way. So the hands-on section here is going to be a blog that I've written. So this blog is something which I wrote about a month ago, and I deployed it to our tech community sites, DevBlogs. We're going to be using GitHub Codespaces. Is an ID. We're going to be using a Go web server, and we're going to run some unit tests. And the unit test is just going to check for some files to make sure they're all in the right places. We're going to build the application in a multi-stage Docker image, and then we're going to deploy it to Azure Container Registry. 
and then to Azure App Services. So we're encompassing all the different sections here, which I spoke about. We're packaging up code into a Docker container. We're storing the Docker container somewhere, and then we're going to be using it. We're going to be deploying it and hopefully have a website at the end. Now, prerequisites to this. Um, if you're doing this locally, then I would certainly recommend you installing the bottom three. So go Docker I mean Azure CLI. Alternatively, if you're going to be using code spaces, which hopefully anybody in the room here is as well, uh, you can use that through your GitHub account. And you don't need any of this because I've got a dev container, which I'm going to walk through. I'm going to show you the code. You have an Azure account, GitHub account, and that's it. That is all you need. Of course, if you're a student, uh, then you can hit this link here. If you are a professional, aka someone who is not a student, then hit the top link, free Azure account at the top. So let's dive into it. Let's go and open this up in a repository, open this repository up in code spaces. If you're following along, then click this link here, which will take you to the repository and fork it. Don't use, don't use moment, fork the repository, and I'll show you how to do that now. So you would head over to the repository. Here it is. Here's all of the code. And you would click this lovely button at the top that says fork. And all that would do is take a copy of this code repository and pop it into your personal account. But what we're going to do is open this up in code spaces. So I already have one up, and it is a lovely name, <laughs> Vigilant Trout, a uh, lovely randomizer. And what this will do is opens up a web browser editor, which is pretty cool. Inside this web browser editor, inside Visual Studio Code, or Code Spaces, whichever you want to call it, we've got a number of things. We've got the dev container, which I kind of alluded to earlier. It installs the Azure CLI. So we're going to be using the Azure CLI, but I don't need to go and install it now. I can just open up the repository, and it's there. Have it already made for you. It's gone off and installed it. So the first instance, it took a moment to spin up, which is why I already have it ready. Um, gone and installed it, done all the funky stuff I needed to do, and I can just go straight ahead and log into Azure. We have got a .github file, which is my deployment YAML. Now, I'm going to get rid of this because that's rather big. In here, we have got the workflow. So it's going to be grabbing a whole bunch of uh, cool things, which we need to um, edit. So in a bit, we're just going to be running through this one. Uh, but essentially, what it's doing is building an image. So I'm using Ubuntu Latest, which is going to be uh, Linux, a Linux environment. We're going to be setting up Go in the container. And we're going to be deploying some of that code. It's then going to log into Azure. And it's going to log into my registry, which is here. So Azure Docker login v1. And then it's going to run a whole bunch of commands. So let's have a look at the code. We have got a go.main file. Now, don't worry if you don't know Go. I'm going to explain all the code. And all it's simply doing is spinning up a web server. So we have got a main function, which has got a handler, which basically spins up a web server. Now, a web server is all about HTTP requests. You're getting and posting. And doing, you may have seen RESTful requests before. Uh, and it's got a couple of routes. Now, this route is a slash. OK, so it's just a home route. So I'm just going to go to my 127.0.0.1, or the equivalent local host. And it's going to give me some feedback. It's going to get me all the information which I have laid out. We have got a test file. Now, this test file here is just checking that main.go is available, go.sum is available, and go.mod is available in the directory. Now, it's a pretty basic test, but you'd be surprised at the number of times when I've come across repositories which have failed tests based on files not being there. Now, these are auto-generated with modules, which is something you need in Go, which is package management, but it's something which isn't always there. So I have a test for it. Now, this is a really simple test case, test case and test code. Uh, but it's very powerful and important. What else do we have? We have got the license file, which, of course, is copyright it's MIT, which basically outlines anyone can use it. I'm not responsible for uh, any damages done, essentially. And then we've got some views. We have got some layouts. And I've got a main handlebars. Now, handlebars is just a templating language, which allows me to embed other bits of code into a web page. And some of you who are familiar with HTML, you may be able to notice that we have a head, a body, and the closing tags of that. Now, that's basically the emulation of a web page. 
I've got a index.hps, which is kind of similar to HTML. Again, we have just got some div containers, and I've got sections. So I've got three sections, and I've got a title, description, uh, another description, and another description. Pretty simple code, right? Now, if I want to spin this up, what I'm going to do is I would do go run main.go. Now, the objective of this is not to teach you go, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go full hog into this one. It is simply to spin this up and show you exactly what the website is running locally. So with a bit of luck, this should all start up. And it will give me some output saying, hey, it started on localhost. And I can go and visit the website. And this is what the website looks like. Pretty simple, right? We've got India, Dubai, USA, places that I like to go every now and then which is all wonderful if I'm running it locally. I don't really want to run this locally. I want to run this in Azure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Codespaces, and I'm going to cancel that one. Now let's have a look and see what the blog says. So we've forked it. We've ran it. We can see it working. Um, this is all the setup, which I'm sort of going through. So we've run it. We've just seen this. We've just got to this part here where we're running the main.go file. In this screenshot, we can see that the port has been forwarded. So if I go and check that out inside my code spaces, I can look at ports. And it isn't showing something there, but it should do. And that's just because it's probably loading still. But you should see localhost in that screenshot. Now let's go and run the test, because I said I got some test files, right? So let's go and check out and see what we actually have. So I can close that now, because I don't need it. So let's go, go test dot slash uh, dot dot dot. And what that's going to do is it's going to run all the test files inside the repository. Hopefully, they should pass. And it's going awfully slow, but that's fine. OK, cool. So we just established that the test code is running. OK, pretty basic test, but it's pretty fundamental. What does the blog say to do next? Well, let's go and look at the multi-stage image. OK, so this is a Docker container. So I've alluded to them earlier. Now I'm going to show you exactly what one looks like. Let's get a Docker file. Now, I've got a whole bunch of pop-ups. I need to ignore that. Now, let me just zoom in a little bit. We have got the very top from. We've got Golang 1.19 Alpine image as build. Now, these Docker containers can get pretty big. If I was to leave it without this, without having a build image, and I was just to use this base image of Golang, it would come to about 400 and maybe 33, 40 megabytes. That's pretty big in container sizes. We want to get it as small as possible. So I go ahead, I copy the source code, I set the, the Go path. So I do my setup in the container. This is essentially a minimal, minimal viable operating system for the code to run. I'm going to do the Go mod download. It downloads my dependencies that I need to use. I build the binary. This is the important line, line number 11. I am building a binary. Now, this is important for a number of reasons, because it allows me to not run go run main.go every time as a command line. I can just build a binary, and I can send it to every one of you in the room, and you can have a copy of my binary. And providing that you're running a Linux machine, it will run on your machine. It's a built binary. It's an application. Now, that's wonderful. The next line is chmod, basically changing the um, access credentials to it. So read, write, update, delete, those kind of things. But read and write are the biggest ones of this one, right? And I'm just changing it so that anybody can access this binary. The permissions of it is the word I'm looking for. But then hold on a minute. I've got Alpine. I've got another from statement. Now, in a Docker image, you dictate what happens in this in layers. Each line of code here is a layer. So I've dictated the first image is going to be Go, and it's a big image. It's quite large. Done all my downloads, built the binary, changed permissions. Now I've got another image. And this is why it's got a multi-stage image, because Alpine is a Linux image. I've built a Linux binary. I'm now using a Linux image. And I'm just going to copy across the views and the binary. So those two lines, copy. Now, that's copying across the handlebars templates, and it's copying across the binary. That's all I need to run this. 
I'm exposing a port 3000, and I'm calling it website. So that's my entry point. I'm going to run the binary. That there comes to a really small image. Now, that's really important because storage, we pay for storage in container registries. We pay for data transfer. You might have timeouts. That can cause problems. So you want it as small as possible. And money. In general, cost efficiency. So it's really important to understand what's going on there. So what else did the blog say? OK, so I've outlined the code. Now let's go and log into Azure. Well, I'm already in the portal, hopefully, if it wants to load today. Um, it's probably actually logged me out, so we're going to give this another go. He says. Oh, it's stuck today. That's fine. We'll come back to that in a moment. We can log in to the CLI into Azure. So as I said earlier, I already have the, container, the CLI installed in this container. I've got a couple of commands that I need to run. So to do this, let's go and oh, I need to log in first. It needs to work. Uh, Azure. There we go. You can skip out of that. Nope, it doesn't want to work today. That's fine. Give it one more go. There we go. Just need a bit of a boot. Lovely. So here's the portal, but I want to log in with the CLI. Now, this portal shows you all the lovely services that we have in Azure, but I need to create a resource group. I need to create a container registry. I need to create all these sort of assets and services I need. It's going to be quite laborious and quite a bit of a chore to do by hand in the portal. So what we can do is we can do it from the CLI. So let's go and log in. I need to log into this with a device code, because that's how Codespaces runs. Now I'm just going to copy over this one, and hopefully pop it in here. Give it access. Head back to the container registry, and hopefully we should see when it's done this thing. So now I'm into my account. Now, these are all my sort of subscription IDs and everything to show me that it's got in and it understands, it recognizes that's my account, they're tied together. What's the next step? Well, we now need to go and create an Azure resource group. So I've got a couple of commands already laid out. These are the same commands. I just, instead of changing each individual line on the fly, I've already written them out for us. So what are we doing? We need to create a resource group. And I'm going to create it in West Europe region. Hands up if you know the difference between regions and availability zones and how it all scopes around with cloud. Right, perfect. So those of you who don't know, the world is obviously split up into different regions. Within those regions, we've got different zones. And in those different zones, you have data centers. It's all about redundancy, fault tolerance, and availability. So I've talked a little bit about content delivery networks. This is essentially how they work. The data centers are all connected in some way and you're able to get data from one to another, depending on where you are. So I obviously want to create this in Western Europe because we cater to the EMEA region here. I wouldn't want this to be stored over in Australia. You know, I might have issues with my app at that point. You know, the website might take a little bit longer to load. Not that you necessarily notice it, but it could certainly become a problem with latency, timeouts, et cetera. So I've gone and created a group. Now that resource group is going to house all of my services that I want to use today. What does it tell me to do next? Well, I need to create a container registry. Where are we going to be building this container? How are we going to be building this container? And where's it going to go? Right. Well, we want to throw it into Azure. We want a container registry. So let's go and create a container registry. And we can do that with the CLI. And I'm going to call it, uh, so in the resource group, demo blog site, which is the resource group I just created. I'm going to call it demo blog site registry. Very unique. I'm going to give it a skew of basic. Now, I'm using basic because I don't need anything verbose. I don't need anything really beefy for this. I just want a basic application. That's what I need. So that's what I'm going to create. Now, dictating by the skew that you use, it dictates how much space you have, the latency, where it's stored, how it's stored, what you're going to be using to access it, how frequently you're going to be accessing and pulling these images. So obviously, the greater the, the skew, the more you have, basically. Cool. 
and it's gone ahead and it has created that for me. So we have, you can see here, it's a lot of, it's quite a verbose output, but we can see here that it's gone ahead and created that uh, registry, container registry for me. What do we have to do next? Well, we want to add, we want to update the admin credentials. I want admin access to this registry. I want to be able to pull. I want to be able to delete. I want to be able to do everything I can to that registry. I don't want anything to get in the way. So we just go and update it quite simply. By, you can do this all in the portal, but I'm just using the command line because it's a little bit quicker and easier to show. But I'm just going to say, uh, update the demo blog registry uh, with the admin enabled as true. And sure enough, that should work. Cool. So again, it just spits out everything which I'm expecting to see. Now I want to go ahead and log in. So I've logged into the Azure CLI. Now I need to log into the registry. I need to tell Azure that, hey, it's me. Although I'm in my account, I do need to access this service. And there's just another layer of protection deliberately. Because say you got into my account. You could do some nasty stuff as a bad actor if you have access to all of my images. You could bring down my whole production site. You could put something up and rickroll someone. You know, it's not really what you want to be doing. So we want to log in. And the way that you do that is by simply passing through some credentials. There is some trickery which I've done elsewhere to help enable this. And this is part of admin. Ooh. OK, so. Docker's not running in my container. And that's a bit of a worry because I need to now restart this container. OK, so that's not a problem. We just need to restart this container. And what this will do is use uh, Docker. And Docker is going to log in. So remember, it uses that Docker login to enable everything. So but let me just figure out how to do this, because I haven't seen this error today. Um, but it all does happen, right? So and it's probably because it all went to sleep. We're going to close this down. And it's going to start again. That's fine. It won't take me a moment to run through. These things happen. It's a live demo. So we're just going to go back into this one. Sorry to everybody online. Just bear with one moment. And let me just restart this. And let me just delete this instance. Should still be able to, everything that I've created so far in Azure will have stayed the same. So no need to worry on that one. If it happens again, it's fine. We'll run it locally. It's all the same. I have it locally as well. Uh, but this was just the step that I was trying to avoid earlier, was having to spend time waiting for this to spin up and start and everything. But hey, it's all part of part. Does anybody have any questions so far whilst we're waiting? So it's not a virtual machine. It's a container. Um, yep, so it's all containerized. So for everybody online, uh, he's asking, um, you know, this is all built. Is Docker inside? Now, yeah, Docker should be. Like I said, I haven't seen this error today. And it's all typical that happens as a live demo. Um, but it's fine. Now, Docker is installed or should be installed as a prerequisite automatically inside this container. Um, so hey, we'll give it a go and see what happens. Takes a moment because I had to download the CLI, and this is why it kind of takes a little bit longer, but that's OK. Yep. Yep. Do we have any questions online? No. OK, that's fine. Well, if you have any questions online, feel free to pop them in the chat. One question. Initially, you said that you're going to use GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions for CI CD. Yep. Um, but we could reuse Azure DevOps as well, CI CD as well. So yep. we, you prefer to choose. Just OK, you can use otherwise any of those. Yeah. Yep, for the sake of this one, I'm just choosing to use uh, GitHub Actions purely because it's my preference. Yeah. Um, again, it's pretty much a carbon copy. They both build pipelines. Uh, the way that I'm using this is obviously all in GitHub. Therefore, I want to keep it in GitHub uh, for me. Of course, you can actually connect your GitHub repositories to Azure DevOps. Um, that is something that happens. Uh, you can do that. You can import as well. You can import registries. Um, yes, right then, we'll see you all hopefully pick up where we left off. Um, and hopefully Docker hasn't sorted this out out. Otherwise, we'll do this locally. And it'll be the same. Same, same, but different. It's 
So pardon part A. Okie dokie. Now, hopefully, should have loaded, maybe. We'll try it. Oh, done it again. Cool. Okay, cool. So it looks like Docker is working. So I'm just going to go into Azure and just check and see how far we got with that one uh, as to whether we were able to create everything. Um, so demo blog site, we created it. And it did create a registry. We just now need to go and log into that registry. Now, here is the telling truth as to whether that worked or not. Let it finish doing its thing, uh, the post create command. That just sets up everything else in the environment afterwards. Now, usually it doesn't take this long just as an FYI. This is purely because I've installed some extra dependencies in the container. Now, if you do this locally, you still have to do the same thing. It still takes just as long. Um, and it's very much down to what you install as a dev container dependency as to how long it takes. So if you want a really quick, sort of simple project where you're not logging into Azure and you're not doing all this extra stuff, then it'll obviously be a little bit quicker. Uh, but because I am, I have this extra load on top and hey, it's just part and part of working with these tools. Not a bad thing, it uh, just you know, helps you. Unfortunately, we actually have to wait for this to finish doing its thing. Anybody else got any questions while we wait? It shouldn't be too much longer now. Um, so how do you come keep to this screen, which is this, uh, this looks like Visual Studio Code, right? Yep. So if I have to start, come to this page, how do, how do I come to this page? Cool, so you can go to that by going to repository. Um, and the question for everybody online was, how do you get to code spaces? Now, you can go to any repository on GitHub that's public or private or yours. Um, and you can click on code. And you see here, usually you would just see this little box here that says, clone the repository through SSH keys or CLI, or HTTPS. There is a little ribbon at the top. And it's called code spaces. And there should just be an option to spin up a code space uh, on main branch. Uh, of course, if you're doing this on my repository, you have to fork it first and then do it, uh, but you'll be able to do that one uh, yourself, and then you can access it. You can also sort of start code spaces on different branches. So if you have development branches, people in your team can spin up a code space on that branch at that commit level. Which means I don't need Visual Studio anymore to spell that out. No, <laughs> exactly. Is Uh, yes, so uh, Codespaces is also free. There is an allowance. Um, it is on the blog. So if you go to the blog, I'll show you in a moment. Um, there is an allowance of a certain number of hours that you get per month uh, for free. Of course, be really careful with this one. Don't overuse or leave them active because you know, it could charge you money. Um, but yes, there is, a, there is obviously an allowance you can get. Suppose you want to do something using the Docker file, and you'll be committing the uh, Codespace itself, and it will be the stack Sorry, say that again. Suppose you want, to, you want to do some changes in the Docker file, right? Yep. And whenever you commit, can we commit directly or maybe it is automatically saved in the GitHub? Uh, you can commit it directly. Yep. So we can, I'll show you, I'm going to show you the GitHub part as well where you can make a change and update as well. So we're just going to log back into Azure into this container as well because it would have lost some state. So pop that code in again, it'll ask me. Wonderful. So that should log in. And now we can go back to logging into our container registry, I hope. There we go, we logged in finally. Uh, yep, it was because I left the code space idle and I will take that for some product feedback. So we've logged into the container registry. So we've got past that second barrier of security that we need. I now need to build the container in the application. So we have the Docker file. I need to build that and make sure that I have something locally, okay? So imagine this is a local development environment, just on a machine, just not your machine, okay? You do exactly the same steps locally as if you weren't running in code spaces. But let's just clear this so it's gone to the top of the terminal. Now, I'm going to be using the command docker build, and then I'm going to specify the platform of Linux, AMD, as the architecture. 
and the operating system. Now I'm doing that deliberately because if I was to run this locally on my Mac machine, I'm using a silicon chip, which is a little bit different to the other architectures that you're using up in the cloud. This caught me out and I spent hours trying to fig figure what on earth was going on when I was first building this. Um, but to be really careful. So it's always good to be explicit with the platforms that you're building your containers for. So I know in Azure, I'm going to be running a Linux box and it's going to be of the architecture AMD64. Now, I also want to tag this with docker.io forward slash the container name and give it a version one. Of course, you can version these containers as you go, version two, three, four, five, or latest if you're really brave enough. And the dot, the period at the end is just specifying in the current directory, if there's a Docker file, run it, build it, do this command to it. So we can see that when we build it, it's going to build this multi-layered image. And then I can show you exactly what's going on with it. It's all part and part of building Docker images. They take time, of course, depending on the dependencies you have. And hopefully at the end, like I said, these are new layers. If you were to edit the very first layer, then of course you have to do all of this again. If you edit one of the later layers in the Docker image, well, then it's a different story because you are modifying the last layer. Everything else stayed the same. So it's going to be cached and you can, you know, you don't have to go through this every time. Uh, it just all depends on which part of the image that you're editing. Cool. So we have built that image. If I do Docker images now in the container, I can see that I've got one here and it's about 15 megabytes. That is a chumping size, lot, a lot less than what it would be if I was just using the bigger Golang image. This literally just contains the views and the binary, which is pretty cool, right? So now we've got a really small image. So we're not going to take up much space in my registry, I'm not going to cost much in terms of data transfer costs, and it's not going to cost much when it comes to money and spending and being efficient, right? Everybody, every business wants to spend as little money as possible and get the most and maximum out of it. So what have we got to do next? Well, we need to tag it to tell it that it's going to be stored in a registry in Azure. And the way we do that is we tag an image. We're just going to tag it by saying, hey, you're currently docker.io. I want to change you to be my Azure CR, my Azure Container Registry. OK, so docker.io is the Docker Hub default registry. As you'd expect, build with Docker, push to Docker. That's just general. We are actually pushing to the demo blog site registry that we created. OK, so I'm going to tag it. Now, if I do Docker images, I can see that I've got two of the same image, or a copy of the same image. As you can see, the image ID hasn't changed. They're exactly the same. So it's just replicating a different tag of it. So I know that I need to push that one. OK, does that all make sense? Just got two of the same locally. Now what I need to do is push it to the registry. So I've created a registry, created my image, I've tagged it. Now I need to push to it. I need to actually shove it up in the cloud and throw it there. And again, you just use these Docker commands as you would locally, as you would if you're used to using Docker or Podman. If you're using Podman, of course, that's the open source version of Docker because there is obviously a paywall with Docker if you're an organization. Do you see how quick that was? If I was doing that with a 400 megabyte image, that would still be going. It would be going for a couple of minutes. And when I was doing this previously with a bigger image, it timed out, and quite rightly so, because who wants to be waiting so long for that? Really important in CI CD pipelines. You want it to complete really quickly. You want it to be done as quick as possible, efficiently, and as cost effectively as you can. So let's go and have a look at the blog that we were reading from. So we've done. You know, these, we have logged into the registry. And of course, I have a picture here, probably not very able to see it in the audience or online, but it's essentially just showing that I've pushed it to Azure, which I can go and actually show you now. So we've logged in. Here is the demo blog site registry. And as you can see, I'm actually using some space, not a lot of space, but I'm using some. Now, I didn't actually create a repository, but it automatically knew from what I was pushing what to call the repository. It took a default name. You don't have to specify it. I could if I want to, I just didn't. But in here, we can see that I've got version one and I've got the digest. And all the digest is is just a SHA hash saying, hey, this is an image. This is the number it, name or number hash of it. Uh, and if you want to download it and pull it, we're just going to make sure that they match to make sure you got the correct image. That's all it does. It's just a long, scary number. Um, goes quite technical, 
but it's there. So we can see that we actually have it. And we can see the layers. We can see what's really going on inside. Again, doesn't mean much, but to a system who's reading this or pulling this, it actually does. So we have an image in Azure. What do we want to do with the image? We want to create an app service. We want to create an app service which is going to run this image and is going to take it and deliver our website. So how do we do that? We are going to create an app service. Again, we could do all of this from within the portal, but it's always fun to use the CLI. It's a bit quicker, and there's less point and click and having to everybody to remember it. So let's go and have a little look at the dev container. So we've got AZ app service plan create. To run an app service, you need an app service plan. This dictates exactly how beefy your machine's going to be. The app service plan can be basic, well, free, basic, and then they go up in the tiers. Obviously, the more you pay, the more beefier it is, the more CPUs you have, the more memory you have, the faster it is. This is for scalable. App service is a serverless instance or serverless service. We've kind of spoken about that briefly. Uh, it allows you to scale down to zero and scale up as you need to. And of course, we only need a really small one because it's just a small demo website. This is perfect for your personal blogs. Right? If you want to create a personal blog, if you want to create a travel blog or a website, this is perfect because not millions of people are not going to be using it on a you know, Black Friday sale. It's just going to be your friends, family, recruiters, people you want to show it to. Okay? It's, well, unless you're super popular and you deliver blogs and books and they get thousands of hits, then you might want to up it. But for now, we're just going to do a, uh, a simple one. I'm going to call that demo blog site app service plan. Very unique with my naming, as you can see. <laughs> um, SKU is B1, which is basic, and I'm going to give it uh, Linux. We've already dictated that the, let's see, the image is a Linux, uh, Linux stock container or Docker image. So now we're going to go and create an app service plan. Let that do its thing, and it should come back with hopefully a success message. And then the next step is to actually create an app service on top of it. So I apologize, a bit slow, but pardon part. So you see here, we have created it. Now, all of this feedback is just telling you the ins and outs of that. So if you're in the portal and you're ticking boxes and checking in things and selecting from drop downs, very much giving you the same information here as you would be selecting over there. So again, just looking at the SKU, you can see the timeout, you can see tags, you know, instances, work accounts, etc. You know, pretty basic. So now we have an app service. We need to create an app. So we have an app service plan. We now need to create an app service. So how do we do that? We use the CLI again. And we're going to run a much larger uh, command here. But it makes sense. We are going to be calling it. Uh, I apologize. That is quite low down. Uh, but web app create. Again, part of the CLI. It's just a service API to create a web app for us, or an app service. In the resource group, demo blog site, what we've done, we're going to be using the plan, which is the app service plan that we just created. We're going to give it a name, and we're going to call it demo blog site app, and the deployment container, the image name, which is obviously from our registry that we've pushed. So it's going to go off and pull it and do what it needs to do. Now, at this point, you might have issues if you have um, names which are not unique. Uh, so you might often see like a big red line that says, hey, you can't make it. Not a very nice error message, but sometimes it happens. Uh, and that's just because you haven't called it something unique. You, these names need to be globally unique. I often just try and call them something that I'm playing with, uh, such as this one, demo blog site. And it doesn't matter about that yellow one, uh, because we don't need any credentials for this one. And it should hopefully do its thing. But what's the next step? So we've created it. Uh, we, again, we're now going to browse to it. So once it's up and running, once it's created, we can go and browse to it in the website. And there we go. It did actually create eventually. As you can see, all of this feedback that it gives us from the service API, again, you don't necessarily need to read it. It just, as long as there's not a big red line, uh, you're pretty much OK to go. Now, we can go and check this out and go and see how far along it gets just by going to look at the app service itself. So we have got the app service here, demo blog site app, and give it a bit of space. Let's go and check out the deployment center. So again, we're in the portal now, and you can see what's going on and sort of how it's all behaving from within here. So let's go and look at 
no nope, configuration, sorry. Here you can see um, registry, settings, passwords, everything that we're using. I don't know why that's suddenly gone blank. Uh, basically, it's the environment variables that we are using. So obviously, we logged into Azure Container Registry. We've logged in using Docker. Uh, we've logged into the Azure. So all of these things which are associated with our app service plan at the moment, or app service, is going to be stored in here. Now, looking at the configuration, we can see that it's being pulled from Container Registry. You know, which container registry? Well, the demo blog sites and the image demo blog site container, everything that we've built and played with today, uh, tag v1, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a minute because we need to check this little box, but I'm going to tell you exactly why and how we need to check it in a minute. But we can have a look at the logs from in here as well. Now, this will tail the logs and show you exactly how far along it's got. I'm actually expecting this to fail straight out of the box purely because of the app service plan we're on, pretty slow, pretty sluggish. Um, but once you're up and running, uh, it is usually um, all OK to go. Now, let's try and run it. Now, who has heard of cold starts before? A couple of people, the expected. A cold start is when you have a serverless service. And the analogy that I use when I'm talking about it is if you are asleep on the sofa, and somebody nudges you and says, hey, Liam, get up. I need you to come and wash the dishes. You're going to be startled. You're going to be like, oh, well, I'm going to be, OK, let me get my thoughts together. Let me just get ready to do the dishes. That's a cold start, because if I'm already up sweeping the floor, and somebody says, boom, come on, Liam, let's go do the dishes, straight onto the dishes. OK, so effectively, a cold start is when you're just getting ready and starting things up, completely the same with serverless services. Serverless is a horrible word because servers are still used and very much, <laughs> exactly. Um, they are very much there. You just need to wake them up. And of course, being a serverless service, this sometimes happens uh, here. Now, this has all been a bit slow, but uh, let's see if we can go and browse to it. Now, hopefully, this should go and open up a new window for me. And da -da -da, open that one. Now, this is just going to take a moment. This is going to time out for me, um, but that's totally fine, because after a moment, it will just kick itself, uh, pick itself up, and it will run with it. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go and look and see what else we have to do. Now, again, that's the error that we're expecting, this application error. Um, like I said, it's just because it's a bit slow to start up. Uh, and we can go and check out the log stream and see what's going on with this application. So let's go and have a look at the log stream. <clears throat> It was the one thing I was hoping was loaded a minute ago, but um, this one is the live log stream that's running. So we can go and check out what's going on. Now, it does say that it has started. OK, so it does know that it's there. It knows that it's ready to accept connections and understand. We saw this in the container. That's what we're expecting to see when we run our binary. But unfortunately, because it's a little bit slower, if I was to have an app service plan, which is on a much beefier version, then of course, it wouldn't be so slow to start up. But because of where we are, and because of the priority of this being quite a, you know, a low priority application, it's just going to take a moment to spin up. Not something to put you off. It's just something that happens when you're playing with free tiers. Now, this is the most important part, is this is all free. Everybody here that has a student account or has an Azure account, uh, you can use this for free. Everything which I'm doing today is free, um, obviously within the limits of the trial or the sort of the free tier, should we say. So. Once it's up and running, we should expect to see it in a moment. And this is where we're going to head into the GitHub Actions workflow. And then we're going to, well, actually, I'll pause that and answer some questions. Um, but we'll head into the GitHub Actions workflow and check out some CI CD and see how we can make a change and have it automatically happen on a pull request, for example. And we're just going to let it time out and do its thing that it needs to do. Whilst I'm waiting for that, do we actually have any questions? Silent. One? OK, one in the corner. Uh, so the question is, is it best to uh, have multiple containers for different requests? Now, that really depends on your system. So if I had a website which had serverless services integrated for payment and a different service for adding to a basket and a different service for you know, different parts of the website, adding to the catalog, of course, you'd have those separate if you're running in a serverless architecture. The flip side of it is if you're running a three-tier application, which is going to be a front-end, and a database and a server for the logic, well, then you 
have one stream of data, right? You have the front end talking to the server, the server talking to the database, and all the way back again. So in answer to your question, I wouldn't say it's best practice. It's up to how your, how your solution is or what your solution is to your, your problem, right? For this one, we just have a simple website. So all the requests are going to be going to this one server. And this server is um, delivering the website content. So it's delivering the front end. It's delivering the web pages and the images and everything. And admittedly, it's taking a moment to, to load up. And it's quite not usually this long, but um, it certainly does time out after a minute. So yeah, in answer to your question, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's up to you and what you have um, and what you're dealing with. So actually, in lieu of this, we'll just sort of crack on. So I kind of walked us through the um, deployment YAML earlier. So I, I walked us through this file. And this file here is our workflow. Now, it's a little bit different. Obviously, I'm using the Go image 1.19. But it doesn't really matter. Go is typically backwards compatible. Um, so in terms of language versions, it's OK. I'm using 1.17 here. Of course, I could change it if I need to. And we kind of, this is the code itself here. OK, so let's look at it. We're setting up Go. We're running the tests, which I've showed you in the container as well. And logging into the server and then running the same Docker commands that I just ran locally. So we're emulating everything which we've just done manually in one file. OK, does that make sense? So everything that we've just run manually in the terminal, we are running now in automation. So this is removing me from the process. This file removes me as a developer, as a person, completely out of this window. I don't need to touch this. I just push a code change to the main branch, which is dictates here. Uh, so on a push to the branches of main, it's going to kick off the workflow. Now, this workflow dispatch is a really cool bit of code because this allows me to run it manually. I will show you this in a moment as well, because it looks like this is also timed out. Um, there we go. It has, there we go. So there you go. I did expect it to time out and work. It has worked eventually. Uh, but as I was saying, um, these are all everything which I've run locally that I'm going to run in a file. So like I said, here it is, the working, the fruit of my labor, basically, um, a website in Azure. Now. Let's go and check out the actual code to make a code change. Because it's all good and well saying, hey, look, Liam, you deployed it, end of. Cool. But I want to automate this. I want to make sure that I can uh, see the code change, make them happen, so I don't have to do all this laborious tasks in my terminal every single time. So let's go and check out this deployment file. I also need to change something in here myself because I have got a different image name and a different server. So let's go ahead and change that, shall we? So the uh, image name that I had was um, demo blog site container. I need to make sure this is all the same, because I want it to run, and I want it to push it um, to the right place. And that is also the server. So let's go and check the server and make sure the server is OK. So the server which I was pushing to um, was, where are we? Somewhere along here, the demo blog site registry. So I need that to be like so. And I can just double check that um, by looking at my container registry that I created a moment ago. And just by cross-referencing here, I created that registry. This is the server that I want to push to. So that's all wonderful. Now I need to make sure that my uh, GitHub repository has access to everything which I have put in manually as well. So remember, I had to log into my server, right? So I need to make sure that this has got access to that server. The way that we do that is by running a simple command down here, which allows us to uh, show my credentials. Now, everyone's going to see this on here and live online, but don't worry about it, because I'm going to change it straight after anyway. <laughs> because I know that's not the most secure thing to do on a live stream. So I run this, and it will show me the container registry password and value. I now need to go and add this to the repository itself to make sure it has access to this registry. So I am going to um, go into my registry over here, go into the settings. I need to uh, go down to da -da -da -da, actions. I think, nope, secrets, there we go, actions. And in here, I need to add a new secret. Now, 
A secret is something which I don't want people to be using out in the wild. I don't want anyone to know it or see it. And I'm going to have the ACR, uh, ACR username, which is, of course, what I have called it <coughs> over here. So username is going to be demo blog site registry. I don't need anyone to see this. I don't care for it. I add that as a secret. The next one I need to add is a password. So we have ACR password. Now, of course, there's two passwords for security reasons. Um, I'm just going to choose the first one, which is over here. So you can see password, password two. But um, I'm not too worried Ooh, about those. Let's go and add that in over there. Now I can't access those. They're, they're, I mean, I can, but I don't want to. But they're now gone. You should be deleting, keeping it secret. No one should see them except yourself. So these are just the steps that are going down. Again, you can see this in the portal as well in Azure, in your registry. Um, but I now need to go and make a change to my application because I want this to update on command. I want to push to my main branch and see it happen. So let's go and make one little change to this application that's running. I need to update it to allow for CI CD. CI CD, DevOps, continuous deployment. I need to make sure that I can continuously deploy whenever there's a change that has been or happened to my registry. It's called a webhook. So that's what it's going to go and create. So I can click on and click save. What have we done? That is pretty much the end of it. I'm now going to go and make a code change. So the, what I want to do now is hopefully, if it hasn't timed me out again, uh, we're going to go make a code change to the title of this. Now, at the moment, this says, you know, your new travel blog. Wonderful. It's pretty vague, pretty, nah, in, you know, it's pretty boring. Let's go and say Liam's travel blog. Let's just go and make a code update and see what happens. So we go back to this one, find the code in here. Let's go and check out. I actually don't know where it is. So we're going to go find it. Uh, we have a title. So I'm guessing it's going to be in the main.go file. So it says your new travel blog. OK, wonderful. So let's just say Liam's travel blog. I'm going to save that file. And as we can see over here, we've got some changes that have happened. And we just want to update. We want to add this one. So we want to add this to staging. And I want to add that file to staging as well. Now, this is just part of Git and version control. So again, it's all part of keeping your code up to date. Everybody who has this repository can now go and see that I've made these changes and these commits. And let's just go and say, um, make the blog work. Because at the moment, it's broken. The build is broken. Hopefully, if we uh, commit and push, hopefully that should go straight to our main branch. Fingers crossed. Now, by the way, you shouldn't ever push to your main branch, just as an FYI. Um, for sake of this, it would be a feature. And then you'd put a pull request in. Uh, but I guess for time's sake, because it's already 8 PM, let's go and push to our main branch. And hopefully, we'll see this uh, in GitHub. So let's go and check out the code. We have got an action running. Now it's telling me what it's doing because actions is the CI CD pipeline. As you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of failures. That's fine. This is just a demo repository. Uh, but let's go and check out and see if it works. We can drill straight down into it. As we can see, it's set up go, it's test past the tests, and now it should be logging in. So, like I said, it has done everything I needed it to do in the, in the work file. Gone ahead, Docker build. And it should be pushing to the registry. Now, hopefully, you know, this might take a moment because it's the first time that it's doing it. But again, these are all cached. These are all understanding everything it understands in the background. But this is really cool. This is a really cool way for you to implement automation. At least it's running. This is the main part. <laughs> and there we go. It has got it to the end and it has pushed it. So we can now go and check out Azure and go and see the logs. Now, hopefully, there should be some update. It might take a moment to update straight away. Uh, but we can go and see everything that's happening in here. And it should recognize with a webhook that it has uh, changed. And sometimes it shows it. Sometimes it doesn't. It's just the log stream and you know, part and part of being on the free, free plan. Uh, but we can go ahead and check out the website in a moment. Hopefully, it should do something, I hope, or at least recognize that there is. There we go. As you can see, it's recognized that something has happened. And 
we can go ahead, once it is ready, it is up and running, so login's enabled, all of this stuff, we can see it's running. Let's go and refresh this and hopefully it's changed. So now all I need to do is make a code change to my main branch or make a pull request to my main branch with any code change that I have. And I can do this and update it on the fly. I don't need to build the container. I don't need to push the container. It does it automatically. This is part of DevOps. This is what DevOps really is. It's saving you time, removing manual steps, removing manual labor, essentially, from the process, and ultimately removing mistakes that can be made. You know, I could type in a command four times and three times out of the four times, I could get it wrong. You don't have to restart it, that's time. You know, with this, you just push it once and it's gone, it's done. And with that one, I'm gonna conclude because it is 8 p.m. and I wanna thank everybody here for coming. Um, I do recognize it is loud. Um, late, sorry. So that's everything we've done. I forgot that slide. If you would like to connect, then please do uh, scan this QR code. And uh, thank you. Do we have any questions online? Uh, yes. Which one was that one? Hey guys, why choose Azure instead of AWS? AWS has a bigger market share. Oh, I love it. I love that question. I get asked that all the time. Um, there is no real reason to choose one over the other. It really depends on your problem in hand and the solution that you want. Some people may want a service which might be cheaper in AWS than it is in Azure and vice versa. There may be a service which is cheaper or more scalable in Azure than AWS. It really depends on your problem and the solution that you want to have. Uh, market share aside, it doesn't really matter. That's just dictating where the market currently is. Uh, like I said, it really matters and depends what you have at hand. I get asked that question all the time at conferences, nine times out of 10. Another question online. Um, someone was trying to follow along with the exercises. Yep. I, he, they seem to have missed how you deployed the image to the container registry. Okie dokie. Um, let's just jump out of here and I can quickly show you this. I'm just going to do the online questions first because it allows us to end the stream and then we can carry on in person um, from there. So the connecting to the container registry is very much uh, this command here, AZ ACR login. And all you do is you give it the name of the registry that you have previously created and it allows you to log into that using a Docker daemon. Docker daemon is running in the background. You can have it running locally, or you can have it running in the container like I did. Unfortunately, it did, um, it did fail the first time. But that is what you have to do. You just log in using that command there. So once you've got into the CLI or into Azure, you can log in using that command. OK, cool. Um, with that one, then, I think we can end the stream. So a massive thank you to everybody that has joined online. And I will take questions in person now.